Now in point 11, verse 11, expositors, 1 Corinthians 2.11. Let's take a look at it. Remind us what the verse actually says. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man, the human spirit, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Paul's making a comparison. So let's see what Expositors has to say. For here, for here points to an illustration that will show that the spiritual wisdom and truths of God can be understood only through the Holy Spirit, just as human wisdom needs the Holy human spirit to understand it. The conclusion is that only the Holy Spirit can reveal God's wisdom and truth to man. The concept of spirit, lower case s, in this verse involves a real personality who thinks and acts, not a force. The expression, the man's spirit within him, in other words, his human personality spirit, being so to speak, being in him, is not to be taken as suggesting that the Holy Spirit of God is in God in the same way. The grammar of verse 11b does not suggest this. So some might contend that, but we can't draw that conclusion. The only analogy made here is that, as the human spirit knows or understands human wisdom, so hutos, the spirit of God being God himself, understands the wisdom of God. Now moving on to verse 11, let's take a gander at verse 11. <clears throat> now we have received not the spirit of the world, the foolishness wisdom of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. We have the avenue by which we can understand, study, and show ourselves approved the word of God, and thereby the Holy Spirit's teaching will enable us to choose to believe what the words say should we make an effort to study it properly. You don't put up the proper study and diligence, you're not going to get information for nothing from the Holy Spirit. You have to make an effort to be faithful as a Christian and study and show yourself to prove. So, verse 12, by way of application, Paul states that it is the Spirit of God they have received. This is in contrast to some other kind of spirit through which some might try to know God's wisdom and truth without success, whether the spirit of the wisdom of this world, which will fail, or another kind of spirit, 1 John 4, 2 to 6. Let's just take a look at that. 1 John 4, 2 to 6. Now this exposure just digresses a little bit. Sometimes you have to just kind of wade through it. By this know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Okay. See, they're digressing, and it's unnecessary to go that far, but nevertheless. Oh, we're losing our spot here. So, the purpose of the Holy Spirit's special work of revelation, which is the subject of this verse, Paul says that we may understand what you know, the truths God has freely given us. Verse 13. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 2.13. Freely given us to, to us by God, which things, truths, we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, no, foolishness, but in those taught by the Spirit, true wisdom, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So we have the spiritual words, they're actually the words in your translation that you're reading properly translated, and the Holy Spirit enables you, works with you, to see the truths of those things as you study them. It doesn't say just read them, peruse them, and expect the Holy Spirit now to give you all the information. You have to study as you normally would read something, study a, a subject in school, make a, a hard effort at it. So here Paul reverts to the nature of his own ministry. He wants it known that he speaks not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, as he and other associates express spiritual truths in words conveying the real spiritual truth. Again, the contrast is between human wisdom 
and wisdom from God. <clears throat> Moving on to 14. Take a look at 14. Better to go and double check when you... I'm losing track of all these verses. But a natural man... Okay, what is that? Does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised, understood, acknowledged. So in using the generic term, expositor said man, anthropos, the apostle now shows he is speaking of an unsaved man in general, the natural man, generic term, governed as he is only by his soulless human, psychikos, nature, his human nature, not accepting the enlightenment and truths from the Spirit of God. These are spiritual truths, and your will fights that, even though you could very easily, as some atheists do, read it properly. You'll discern what it's saying, you just won't believe it, or you'll purposely twist it or make up your own machinations of it. A lot of people do that. They take the same words you say, twist your words, and throw them back at you with something you didn't say. Therefore, such a person considers those truths to be foolish. Paul makes it even stronger when he says that the man without the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, cannot understand because these truths can be concerned and under discerned and understood only with the guidance of the Spirit. It's a subtle thing. Man is going to be held accountable for properly reading or listening to what God has said or looking at nature and concluding somebody had to design all of this. This is too complex. Human body, too complex, and so on. But you won't do that. You will not do that. It's a matter of the human will. It's not a matter of whether you can read something, understand. The Bible is not rocket science. There's some things that you have to take by faith because the rest of the stuff leading up to it makes absolutely plausible, perfect sense. <clears throat> so the things that you can't prove out, and there's some things in science. Science cannot prove out <clears throat> how the world was created <clears throat> because science scientists weren't there. They couldn't observe. They couldn't repeat it. They couldn't falsify it. So they can make guesswork out of it. And usually the guesswork is geared towards refuting it. That's their mind is already made up. That's their hypothesis. Creation didn't occur. It evolved. And this is how. And they just suggest, uh, select all those things and lie about all those things to prove their point. That's not science. In any case... Psychikos, the Greek word that begins this verse, basically means that which pertains to the soul or life. A word used in New Testament and patristic literature, early church fathers, to refer to the life of the natural world and so contrasted with the supernatural world and the spirit. So from this comes the translation, man without the spirit. So it is possible that the words of God, with the words the spirit, or a copious edition, a number of manuscripts omit the words. However, we get the point. The vast majority of manuscripts favors their inclusion. Note that the sense is clear either way, that the Spirit of God is in view. It is to be observed <clears throat> that the verb anacrino, translated discern, in verse 14, is the same verb translated make judgments and subject to man's judgments in verse 15. The idea in each case is to make intelligent spiritual decisions. Utilizing what? Well, I keep saying the normative rules of language, context, and logic Nothing more, nothing less. Do, just do a proper reading. But most people that don't believe, all people who don't believe, won't do that. They go off on tangents, cherry pick, exclude, yell, scream, do anything they want, but nothing that is logical. Language, context, and logic. So anacrino, though meaning examine here, includes the decision following the examination to accept as true. Of course. Verse 15. Take a look at verse 15. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Think about that. This is something to really ponder. <clears throat> In contrast, the person who is guided by the Spirit draws discerning conclusions about all things. And his discernment follows the process of language, context, and logic. When it's done correctly, you get the discernment. When it's not, you won't get God's wisdom. You get man's wisdom. 
That is about all kinds of spiritual things. But such a spiritual man is not subject to spiritual judgments by any man. In other words, by any man without the spirit. Any natural man. You're subject to the judgments of God. Man's going to use all his trick, foolishness, to twist what you think is true into what he demands because he's in charge, he's the ruler, or you're part of their group. This is undoubtedly what Paul means by verse 15b, for he has himself elsewhere teaches Christians to make judgments concerning the spiritual condition and actions of other Christians. How do you do that? By, by the word of God. Verse 16. <clears throat> Let's take a look at verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I don't know how many times I've seen this misinterpreted. We're already building up slowly for this verse. This verse is confirmatory of verse 15. In quoting the Septuagint of Isaiah 40, 13, Paul and Jesus quoted the Septuagint a lot all as well. And the other authors quoted the Septuagint a lot. Paul establishes further that the Christian is not a subject to man's judgments and spiritual things. The quotation in the form of a question casts doubt on man's knowing God's wisdom, but the statement, verse 16b, gives reassurance that the Christian does know it. This explains, verse 15b, the person who has God's spirit is not subject to judgments by one who does not have the spirit. See how that works? So when you get in a debate with somebody contending for the faith, which we should do, Jude 3, Philippians 1, 27 to 29, we're going to be actually arguing for the side of God and the words of Scripture properly uh, discerned and related to others without embellishing. Paul introduces the mind of Christ terminology in order to relate it to the Old Testament expression he has just quoted, the mind of the Lord. The verse implies that we and all God's people can understand spiritual truths and spiritual wisdom in a way similar to the way the Lord knows them. Verse 16 climaxes Paul's argument about his preaching God's foolishness, the cross of Christ, without ostentation. Don't elaborate, don't embellish. Let the philosophers of Greece and the Jews in their sign-seeking jeer and mock they cannot really judge the message of Paul, who has the mind of Christ, because they do not have the Spirit of God and cannot judge spiritual truths. We have some notes here on different technical grammatical things. I don't see anything of great importance here. We've covered it all. So, how would you like 1 Corinthians chapter 2? I know I beat it to death because these are very, very subtle things. And they can be twisted and turned every which way. 